In today's video, I am going to be talking about the mistreatment of Kai the Hatchet-wielding hitchhiker. Netflix recently released a documentary on January 10, 2023 about Kai with the official synopsis. A happy-go-lucky nomad becomes an unlikely hero through viral stardom before a downward spiral lands him in prison for a murder he says was self-defense. This documentary had multiple interviews of Kai, along with his family, law enforcement figures and particularly Jessab Reisbeck who had taken the initial interview for KMPH and others. But before I delve into the documentary and why it just didn't sit right with me, let's begin with the beginning of Kai. Who is Kai? Born in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, Kai's official name is Caleb Lawrence McGillivary. In the now infamous interview that spiked his rise to fame, Kai had said that he doesn't have any family and that as far as anyone he grew up with is concerned, he was already dead. It soon becomes evident that Kai had changed his name and is no longer in contact with his family but what exactly happened? Kai's parents, Gil McGillivary and Shirley McGillivary divorced when Kai was only four years old. His father had lost custody and it appeared Shirley became the main caretaker. From Kai's own interviews in the Netflix documentary, it becomes blatant very quickly that Shirley was not a good mother. Kai had said in a 2013 interview that he was locked in a cage and treated like an animal. And on Mother's Day of the same year Kai had posted a message on Facebook about how he was beaten from the age of two and locked alone in a room for up to 20 hours a day. Shirley, who should have never been in the documentary to begin with, claimed that it wasn't as severe as Kai described and what he had said was apparently a result of his mood disorder. Shirley further claimed that she had locked Kai in his room to protect him. What? Her explanation was that she locked Kai as a child in his room to stop him from coming outside earlier in the morning alone. She claimed he was a free spirit and if he got out on his own he would hurt himself. But how true is this statement? As for Kai's father, Gil, there was not much about him in the Netflix documentary. However, soon we heard directly from Gil himself in interviews. Gil had claimed he lost custody of his son after the divorce and said although Kai would move on to live in USA, he had grew up in Canada and spent a lot of his earlier life in homes for troubled teenagers. Gil had stated that Kai had lived in treatment homes until he turned 18 and then they cut him loose and washed their hands of him. Kai made accusations that he was physically and mentally abused at one of the homes and Gil believes the system had let his son down. I have a lot of questions but one of my main ones is why wasn't this explored further in the documentary. There was time and energy to be spent on the chase for Kai but his struggles as a child and teenager was just about mentioned. Especially considering how Kai later becomes convicted for murder which he had said was in self-defense. Surely, it would have been important to address that growing up he had already struggled with abuse. The documentary did not delve more into his past as much as they should have. When I decided to research who exactly is Kai, I was seeing all different kinds of information about him. One that I was seeing frequently was how Kai is from the Canadian indigenous community which was not at all mentioned in the documentary. Kai's father himself was a victim of reservation schools and it was disappointing that the documentary didn't further educate its audience about the lack of support provided for indigenous communities. Furthermore, Kai was 11 when social services removed him from his biological family before he was sent to treatment homes provided by the Bosco Foundation. This foundation is known to provide support for vulnerable children and adults, yet Kai had left their treatment homes at the age of 13 due to him experiencing sexual abuse before living with foster parents who had provided better care for him. Kai was failed at countless times in his life, and as he got older it just worsened. Kai eventually found himself as a hitchhiker. On February 2, 2013, Kai had hitched a ride with Jet Simmons McBride, a choice that has since altered his life completely. They had been smoking a joint that Kai had rolled and had discussed their personal lives when McBride confessed of sexually assaulting a 14-year-old and proclaiming himself as being Jesus Christ. McBride had then rammed his vehicle into the Pacific Gas and Electric Company employee Ray Sean Neely. This hate crime had left Neely with severe leg injuries and he had to use a wheelchair for a long time. But, I feel it is important to mention here that Sue McBride was found not guilty on his highest charge of attempted murder by reason of insanity. When McBride had rammed into the innocent man, bystanders had ran to him to provide help. This angered McBride who had then began to attack a woman, Tanya Baker, who had only tried to aid Neely. McBride had grabbed her into a bear hug and began to grip her hard. Here is where Kai intervened and tried to help Tanya from further harm. He had initially used his hands but when it didn't help, Kai had pulled a hatchet out of his backpack and had hit McBride three times with the blunt side before using the blade. Soon enough the police arrived and had taken McBride away. Kai was interrogated at the crime scene and was let go as everyone at this time viewed him as a hero. This was when the interview occurred. Jessab Reisbeck, who is a sports reporter had in fact been requested to fill in at the news department for KMPH, a local Fox affiliate in Fresno, California. Upon arriving at the scene, he managed to catch Kai before he left and conducted the now infamous interview. Kai recounts what had happened and the way he had narrated it had immediately caught the interest of viewers. In particular the repetition of Smash had become viral and was soon a phrase that was known to many. 
The next day the interview was uploaded to YouTube and it had become an overnight sensation with viewers adoring Kai as a hero while simultaneously becoming fans of his mannerisms and charisma. Soon after the Gregory brothers sampled the interview and published a song which had also become viral and further increased the popularity of the original video with Riesbeck. Naturally, Hollywood wanted a feature from Kai. Kai was receiving numerous offers for interviews and appearances with Riesbeck seemingly proclaiming to be the link between the rest of Hollywood and Kai. Jimmy Kimmel had also wanted to bring on Kai for a feature and what was presented as the chase for Kai in the documentary steadily unfolded the lengths the producers and media personas had gone to bring Kai onto their platforms. There were so many ideas bouncing around in the documentary for what they had in plan for Kai. Many wanted just features and interviews but there were also producers who were ready to create Kai his own reality show. The documentary was entirely misleading in its narrative and did not once portray the members of Hollywood for what they really are, lacking humanity and only wanting Kai to profit off him. What particularly angered me was how Kai had mentioned the abuse he had faced growing up in his interviews but it was edited as there were only certain things they could show on TV. Which is understandable I suppose, but why didn't they address his childhood sooner in this informative documentary? On May 11, 2013, a prominent lawyer and former military man, Joseph Galfi Jr. had approached Kai in Times Square and had offered him a ride in his home for Kai to stay over for the night before he continued his journey to New Jersey. On the first night that Kai had stayed there, they had drank beer and had dinner. Soon after Kai had felt very tired and went to sleep in the guest room. When he woke up the next day and checked the mirror he saw something on him that he thought was drool and wiped it off. Later that day, Kai had been waiting on a friend to pick him up. When his friend didn't arrive Kai had returned to Galfi to stay another night. Once again, after drinking and eating Kai had felt tired and was soon unconscious. When he woke up, Galfi was sexually assaulting him. When Galfi did not come to work the following Monday, his colleague was worried and called his friends and neighbors to see if Galfi was okay. Galfi was a 73-year-old man with health concerns who lives alone and has been living alone since the death of his houseboy who some also knew as his partner. It was natural that his colleagues were concerned and requested for someone to check on his well-being. Robert Ellenport was the first to arrive to the bungalow. He was a close friend of Galfi's and was also the former mayor of Clark. Soon, he was the first to be informed that Galfi had been murdered. Galfi was found lying on the floor, face down in his bedroom in just his underwear and socks. His physical injuries were brutal, with multiple fractures, his ears appearing to be torn off and his brain bleeding. Through text messages found on Galfi's phone, the police were then able to pin Kai to the crime and he was arrested three days later in Philadelphia on May 16, 2013. Kai had stated it was in his self-defense that Galfi had died. He claimed that he had blacked out after drinking during the two nights he had spent at Galfi's home and when he came to consciousness later during Sunday night, Galfi was on top of him, pulling his pants down and attempting to sexually assault him. Kai had fought only for the safety of himself, but the trial did not unfold the way we would have thought it would. Rather, there are only more questions and doubts. It was almost six years later that Kai's trial had finally began during the April of 2019. Kai had been in solitary confinement during most of those years he was held in jail and had attempted suicide at least once. A key thing to note was that the judge, Robert Kirsch, had denied access to cameras during the trial and instructed that Kai's infamous interview and his internet fame were not allowed to be mentioned in the court. In addition, Kirsch had also denied Kai's request to fire his lawyer and represent himself. Kai had at multiple times claimed that the police, lawyers, and judge involved in his case were corrupted and had colluded against him. He had even pointed out that the prosecutor himself repeatedly called Joseph Galfi Joe as if the deceased was known to him personally. But none of the calls of concerns by Kai was taken seriously. Kai's defense team, although thought by many to have been working against him, had raised important points around the case that could simply not be ignored. Some of these questions were, 1. Why weren't the glasses at Galfi's house examined for drug residue when Kai argued his food or drink was laced with drugs? 2. Why wasn't the blood in the semen swab from Galfi tested for DNA? 3. And how is it possible for a case about sexual assault to not have requested a rape kit to be performed on Kai? On the 30th of May, 2019 Kai was officially sentenced to prison for 57 years. During the sentencing Kirsch had said, You created this public image of a surfing free spirit, unshackled by the constraints of materialism and consumption. But underneath that free spirit, the jury saw another side of you. You are a powder keg of explosive rage, a cold-blooded, calculated, callous killer. To which Kai had responded, this has been nothing but a sham trial, and you have railroaded an innocent man. Shame on you. The following section of this video is based on the research I have done and I want to provide a disclaimer that a lot of what I have found has to be said as alleged. But I am hoping to raise awareness about the mistreatment Kai has faced from the justice system and the documentary itself. Firstly, in regards to his case, there were major conflicts of interest. The documentary doesn't cover how well-connected Galfi was. Galfi's brother was the former chief of police. Judge Kirsch is an old friend. Another judge who was initially assigned to the case waited until his personal connection with Galfi was pointed out before stepping down. The prosecutor Theodore Romankow also happened to be a friend of the deceased and yet those aren't all the conflicts of interest. 
it is safe to say that Joseph Gelfi is a man with power and influence, even preceding death. There were also countless red flags in the investigation itself. For instance, in the Gardner and Souter investigative report, it was highlighted that a dishwasher had been run between May 13 and 15 once the house officially became a crime scene. Allegedly, it was James Galfi, again former chief of police and brother of Galfi who was allowed in the house around the time the dishwasher was on. What he could have been doing can only be left to theory and it is one I believe emphasizes that there has been malpractice regarding Kai's case. Something I had mentioned earlier was how Galfi was found with his own semen and unidentified blood on his penis. Yet there was no DNA test done. In addition to the theory that the cups contaminated by the drugs were washed, they had allegedly ran a tox screen and a rape kit that had both come back negative. But this was because the tests were both done on Galfi, not Kai. Kai was denied a rape kit which makes absolutely no sense. Even if they thought Kai was guilty, surely they would think a rape kit would only help their case. Here I have another conflict of interest to be mentioned. The expert doctor, Robert Pandana, had refused for Kai to have a rape kit run on him. Of course, it is expected that he doesn't know the deceased and that is what he claimed. However, in a document from the prosecutor's office, Robert Pandana had apparently received charitable funds from the estate of Joseph Galfi. I don't have anything more to say about that. To support Kai's claim that he was drugged, an eyewitness who saw Kai said he appeared glass-eyed and drugged after he left Galfi's house. If he claimed he was drugged as soon as he was arrested, there is no excuse as to why he wasn't tested. There is clear foul play in case and I won't even be able to cover half of it. I will link some resources below. Please see further detailed information about the case and what happened in the courtroom itself. This should have been a mistrial. Guilty or not, Kai should have been treated fairly in court. I had a lot of thoughts about the documentary itself and rarely was it positive. I wish they had delved more into his earlier life. Kai's past and how he was affected by it wasn't mentioned, especially the abuse he suffered from childhood. It was only mentioned briefly. Then there were the journalists and producers and other media personas who chased for Kai. They had claimed he had the effector. In that moment, Kai wasn't a human being but the current token for fame and popularity. There was an evident desire to exploit Kai and even though they said they thought he was not okay, they didn't want to help. They would have rather provided all the wheat he desired. The greed was cruel and I was confused as to why the main narration for a good portion of the documentary came from them. Their shallow and insincere recounts could have been excluded and nothing of value would have been missed from the documentary. Another moment that caused me discomfort was how the views of sexual assault victims were portrayed. As if there was a certain way they can and cannot behave. Such as the opinion that Kai couldn't have been raped if he went back to Galfi's house for another night. These viewpoints are entirely toxic and would send the wrong message to other victims watching. It just plays into perpetuating rape culture. As for Joseph Galfi, they didn't mention how well-connected he was and how his friends were directly involved in the case. That was such a crucial point regarding the trial and yet it wasn't even acknowledged. This should have been a mistrial. Guilty or not, Kai should have been treated fairly in court. We also don't know enough about who Galfi is. We had interviews from Galfi's neighbors to describe his character but how many of us really know the people around us? If he was a predator what are the chances his neighbors would know? There were limited information about Galfi in the documentary and when I tried to find out more online, I was coming up short. Please let us know in the comments if there is anything you would like to inform the others. Finally, before this video finishes, I do believe Galfi is a rapist and I understand that I haven't got the solid proof required but by everything that is provided, a lot of things just don't make sense. Even if you believe Kai was guilty, I think he deserves another trial because if there is the slightest chance he is innocent, it would be an injustice to ignore.